everyone who's arrived for this sustainable development goal stream and uh, this session is going to be um can i have the next slide please um we're going to be um talking about some challenges global development challenges in indonesia and we've got um three talks coming up for you uh, which are all about disaster relief in indonesia and um i'm just waiting for a minute or so while people are coming in um uh so could i have the next slide please amy thanks um so with a bit of housekeeping now um you you've probably seen in other slides um in other talks that you can position the speaker in the top red right corner so that you can see all the slides and we're going to be using the chat function um in this session uh, you can um you can send us messages you can just say hello because um we can't see each other in in this session as it's a webinar but uh, we'd love to know if um who's there and particularly if you're coming from a developing country um as this is that's our focus today so we'd love to hear from you on chat and if you have questions for the speakers please could you use the q a function um, so we'll be answering your questions um, after the three presentations and you can use the upweight function to um, particularly like um, a question and you you can review a video of this session and other sessions um, after the conference because it's going to be recorded. So um, I think it's about time to to start the talks now. So I'm going to hand over to Stefan Ongo, um, who's also from Southampton, um, and he's going. He's actually from Indonesia. So who could be better? Um, to 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 introduce the talks about Indonesia. Thanks, Stefan. Stefan, are you there? Um, hell, uh, my computer, uh, the monitor is hanging. We can hear you. Okay. Um, in that case, then, uh, can Christine or um, Kuang open up the, the slides, please? Uh, yeah. the slide. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to do that. So we just say, um, next uh yeah okay. i have lost <laughs> there we go um let me just change it so it's full screen mode okay is that all right for you stefan yeah um bear in mind but uh, i'm running blind here okay um thank you everyone for um for for coming um th so the first talk is about um our projects funded by the EPSRC GCRF, um, we call it Relief Ops, which, uh, which is to design a resilient relief supply network uh, for natural disaster in West Java, Indonesia, using optimization fire simulations. So I'm going to present, my name is Stefan Ongo, and followed by uh, Kuang, and Christine is um, kindly, will, kindly will answer all your questions. Next, please. Um, so, the, the theme, as you can see from the, uh, from the slides, um, uh, from in, uh, the theme from Indonesia as well as myself and Christine, you, um, you, you can see our photos there. And then we have uh, Kuang next. Uh, he's a bit shy because he doesn't want his photo to be, uh, uh, to be shown. And we also have the um, RA. And we, are, we, we really grateful with the 
scientific advisory board members. So we have uh, Anna Nagurni from the MM Hearst. Um, I think he is, she is here in the audience. So thank you for um, helping us uh, uh, and uh, willing to become our advisor, advisor in this project. Likewise, we have also uh, Professor uh, Paula Scapara from Ken. Um, she's also um, in, the, in, in the team, uh, in, in, the, in the advisory board team. And Lee Li Luhei, uh, Associate Professor Lee Luhei from NUS Singapore. Um, so they are all in our team. Next, Christine. Now, since our topic is in disaster, uh, speaking of disasters, you can see here uh, on the timeline, um, as much as we can prepare from Christine and I, we really spend a lot of time, uh, sorry, we, we spend, a, we, we, we work quite efficiently. We, we, we almost finished everything in, in a short time, but because of all the, uh, the process behind the, screen, uh, the, the scene, but it still is quite good because we managed to get a postdoc by January. But who knew at the time, by the time our postdoc just received the, uh, you know, managed to get the entry permit to the UK, a day before that, the UK was in lockdown, complete lockdown. So I don't want to, uh, Basically, to cut the long story short, um, he eventually, thankfully, managed to get to the UK on the 1st of August. So uh, just to give you a, a brief um, overview that <laughs> we actually just started in less than two months. So, um, so I, I hope that, that gives you an, uh, an idea what we have done um, uh, so far. So next, please. So... Just to give you the, uh, the challenge that we had, that we have in Indonesia. So this, uh, this is just um, uh, some, of, some of the data, uh, uh, 10 months data in 2019 from January to October. So you can see here, we, within 10 months, we, we are talking about you know, uh, 400 plus landslides, 300 plus uh, wildfire, 200 plus tornado, even 13 earthquakes in just 10 months in this province only, in West Java province only. So we are really um, facing a great challenge here in, this, in West Java. And West Java is especially vulnerable. Uh, well, not vulnerable, vulnerable, yes, but it's also quite important for Indonesia because it's, it's the, uh, the, uh, a province with the highest GDP uh, in Indonesia. So disaster will have a significant impact to Indonesian economy. And you can see here we are talking uh, about 90,000 people affected by all the disasters. It means these are people that we need to help, we need to feed dur uh, during this time. Um, so the probability of getting or experiencing earthquake in this province, you can see here, is quite, it's not negligible. I guess probably uh, if Paul has a time later, he can probably tell us about what is the chances for Paul to have, uh, to experience um, earthquake in Indonesia. Uh, maybe if he has time, the second speaker can explain about that. But it's, that is real, uh, it's a real, real challenge for us. Next, please. Now, this is the uh, West Java uh, uh, map. So we have, what we have done so far, we have calculated um, the uh, index risk of multiple, um, Disasters. So we have calculated four. Uh, we have calculated four uh, index for sorry, index for four disaster types: flood, earthquake, landslide, and volcano. And then we combine them in, in um, using a weighted average, I believe. And then we come up with an index risk. So we color coded the the map, the, the regions into uh, this index list. So you can see here most of the area in the uh, from center to south. They, they are quite red. So naturally, if you can see here, um, the green stars are the warehouses that uh, the Indonesian government has. So naturally, the, uh, the, the warehouses are mostly located in, in the north of the province. Um, next, please. So uh, the next slide basically will give you a, a brief idea about uh, 
the process, the procedure in Indonesia. So we start with the refugees, the one in, um, in red in the middle. So whenever there is an accident, uh, sorry, incident, whenever there is a disaster, so um, there were, it, it, it might cause, uh, may, might cause some people to become refugees. So these are people that we need to help, we need to feed. And in this case then, um, the uh, regional uh, leader, it can be a mayor or a governor, they will declare an emergency. So when they declare emergency, straight away, uh, one of the units with you, you can see on the top left called BPBD, uh, they will send their team and then set command center. And this one in the command center, they also set what we call food distribution center. Now, food distribution center, if you look at the, uh, the towards the bottom center, there's a logo uh, called food distribution center. It will be supplied by a number of warehouses because they will supply rice, which is the main staple food for Indonesians and also with uh, some other, uh, like the vegetables, the meat and uh, water as, as, uh, and many others. So there is a certain procedure, basically, um, if the local warehouse is not enough, they will uh, escalate the, uh, the, 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 the requirement to the next government level. So from the city level, if they don't have enough, they cannot handle it, they will escalate the, the case to uh, the province level. If for some reason, the province cannot handle it, they will escalate it to the national level. So basically, these, uh, are, these procedures are captured in, in, this, uh, uh, in this slide. And one more thing is that uh, legally, by law in Indonesia, um, when there is a disaster, then um, they will declare emergency period, and then the length of the emergency period is typically um, uh, less, uh, maximum 50, 14 days. In some cases, for big disasters like uh, recently in Palu, uh, then the emergency period can be extended. So I, I will hand over uh, the next slides to Kuang. Uh, Kuang, you can take it over. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Stefan, for passing uh, the slide to me. And also, first of all, I would like to thank uh, both Stefan and Christine for the opportunity to work on this very interesting and challenging project and also very impactful in that uh, I would uh, expect from your project. Uh, so uh, uh, here's roughly what I would uh, think uh, I would understand about the project. So here we, we provide a municipal service. Uh, um, and the service will create when there's some disaster try happens. And at the same time, the disaster will uh, struck also our um, infrastructure. So the problem is um, it's not a uh, kind of classic uh, optimization problem, but rather something uh, dynamic and stochastic at the same time. So it's, it's very challenging to address. So here's the way I would like to think about the, the system. I would like uh, my my personal uh, preference is that I would like to separate things into independent components so that when when uh, when I de develop something, it could have less uh, the minimum impact on the other components. So here we separate the problem in three components that you can see on the figure, which is uh, three gray regions. And the the, uh, the higher, highest level uh, component is the simulation level where we um, where we create the di disaster and uh, create the event for all the time horizons. And that will be fit into the two day-by-day -day operations management components, which you can see below. The first one is uh, uh, relief operation dispatching, and the, and the other is inventory management. So I will, I will summarize them in three work with uh, shock to address later on with the simulation inventory and dispatch. And, and the, all of them will interact you know, together to, to, to simulate um, you know, what will happen during, uh, during a scenario, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? Thanks, I, so I, I would like to say uh, briefly still thinking about the, the, the uh, three components. The for the inventory, we will, uh, we will assume that uh, they work independently and they, they use some preset policy and uh, for now, we we'll focus on the events that uh, the, the, the disasters try that uh, try uh, quite regularly, but it's a, it's a small disaster. 
and we may need to modify the model later to, for some large uh, uh, some some kind of severe event that can entrain uh, many small disasters together and that could be uh, and that uh, separately or we have to mod modify the model and the dispatch uh, uh, will be about our size vacant to the warehouse which I will go more in the detail in the next slide but what I want to say here is that it, it can uh, more direct to address because we can see that from the data we, how the munis municipality uh, currently address uh, um, uh, the allocation and also the assignment okay okay Christine can you go to the next slide thank you so so here in uh, in 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 each uh, in, uh, uh, I cannot see the title, but that's okay in the slide. Uh, here in each, um, <coughs> for everyday management for the dispatch allocation of the uh, and, uh, assignment of, uh, that means we want to send vacant to, uh, to the affect location. We will uh, collect the data from the two other components, basically the demand from the simulation and the quantity of item that are able to, that's a warehouse for the inventory management components. And we will have an optimization problem which we can drive the M as a mixed integral model, which I will show you next. But we will have three objectives to optimize and we have to implement the solution. So they will be considered in order. The first one will be the fulfillment of the demand. The second one will be the response time and the third one will be uh, the, the cost of the operation. Okay, in, in terms of uh, modern links, the most important variables, uh, not really most important, but the most representative is to uh, assign the um, uh, which quantity of item we I want to assign to, to a vacant to, to deliver from a warehouse to a, a affected location, okay? And in this uh, variable, I, uh, the time index is uh, omitted because for, for day operation, is it will be local for the day, okay? But now there's an index that is uh, omitted, which is uh, the scenario index, but uh, again, it's, it's local for the day. Can I see the next slide, please? Okay, so, so here's the constraint of the problem. So far, we have identified three constraints of the problems. Uh, the first one uh, kind of obvious is the capacity of the vacants and the availability of the item based on the inventory uh, components. Um, and basically, uh, I have to uh, clarify here that we allow the vacant to go to the uh, affected location multi time, uh, like to deliver the quantity of items. So it's, uh, it can go back and forth between the warehouse and, 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 the, um, and the affected locations uh, to, to complete the missions. But there's only one mission per day. I guess uh, currently it's, uh, to assure that the, the response time will be small. But it's, it's, it's rest to be discussed later on, for example, if we want a multiple disaster, maybe we, we need to rethink about this uh, constraint. And the third constraint is about the operational time. So for a day of operation, of course, we have only 24 hours to react to for that day. But also for the vacant, it's had, it cannot be operational for a certain time amount before it had to be checked or verified for maintenance or something like that, okay? So we have the three constraints here and we can, we have to introduce certain variables which is only related to the quantity of item being uh, uh, sent. Okay. Okay. So can I go? Uh, can I have this next slide? So, uh, in terms of objective, like I said before, there are three objectives. The first one will be the uh, fulfillment of the demand. So, so we want to fulfill the. Um, uh, we, we want to minimize uh, the unmet demand. So that is uh, the most priority uh, objective uh, we have in this local model. Uh, and the second one is uh, about the response times. So, so the, it's going to be the, the time for the last item to arise at the affect location for, for its affect uh, location. So we allow multi vacant to deliver for the same affect location, okay? And the third will be the uh, deployment and operational cost. This uh, depend on how, how we construct the vacant and uh, on how, uh, also the connection be between the, um, uh, between the, the warehouse and the affected location in, in the graph of the models, okay? So one thing I want to, to mention about the, the slide here is that the parameter will be written on the left and I usually write in terms of the function on the right now you will get the formulation and the variable will, will be uh, indexed by, by the subscript, okay? The parameter will be written like a like, like function. And also the parameters that will be dynamic support them. That means it's, it's been, 
Khan dependence and scenario dependence will be written with the Jinda in uh, for example here we want to check along in length will be different because because uh, basically it's a connectivity it depends on connectivity in between and the, what could affect the what disaster could affect the connectivity and that can change the the table length also the timing as well okay so uh, I'm afraid so we're out of time now for this talk so would you be able to wrap up yes thank you so uh, here again uh, uh, so so when the scenario finished we will uh, collect all the on the data in the simulation and it comes from different components that you can see on the slide and in this uh, general model we have a more, can have multi-objective problem and um, and uh, basically we have to consider uh, i mean expectations so we have a stochastic problem that i have to remind you okay so roughly that is what currently we have for the modeling so far and we have to invest more in the inventory side and also uh, in, uh, the simulation side to complete the modeling uh, test and uh, them okay so thank you very much uh, that i have so far for the, for the for this presentation Okay, so let me introduce you to the next speaker. Um, the next speaker is um, Paul Harper and his team, Mark Tucson and Sari Bryce from uh, Cardiff University. They are doing um, uh, emergency medical services modeling uh, in Indonesia. And as you know, Paul has done a lot of works uh, about ambulance uh, optimizations. And, now the team wants to apply to in the in Indonesian context, which has several uh, maybe different challenges. Paul, I'll offer to you. Great, thanks, Stefan. Let me just share screen. Okay, thanks everyone for uh, joining this session. It's great to see everyone. Um, so yes, this is also a project funded by the same uh, EPSRC call with Global Challenges Research Funds. Um, as the other two talks in this session. Unlike the other two uh, projects, we don't yet have a nice flashy acronym, so we have to work on that. Um, so this is a collaboration um, with people at Cardiff. Uh, I'm sorry, and uh, Mark, uh, the research associates on the project who are going to also speak uh, to this presentation. We're also delighted to be working with uh, Justin Utilia, who's in the US, and our fabulous partners in Indonesia are the Ambulance 118 service, which we will talk a bit more shortly. And also delighted that a partner here in the UK is the Welsh Ambulance Service NHS Trust. And we have uh, a lot of input from them. And importantly, they're also going to be offering to train paramedics in Indonesia as part of this project towards the end, which is a, a fabulous um, outcome. So, a little bit of context and significance before I hand over to Mark and Sari to talk through the detail. Um, so access to pre-hospital medical treatments is critical, but a serious concern in many low to middle income countries, as we know, and time sensitive medical emergencies are important, but account for nearly a third of all deaths in those countries. Uh, in Indonesia in particular, traffic accidents account for 70% of the country's trauma deaths and one in three deaths are caused by strokes and heart disease, heart attacks, where of course rapid access uh, to appropriate treatment is vital and so emergency medical services are, are critical there. But the situation in Indonesia is not great. There's a lack of public ambulance service. Uh, ambulances are mostly allocated to private hospitals and they don't really act as emergency ambulances. They act more as a transfer of patients between hospitals. Um, there are particular challenges to Indonesia and, um, and that is the vast geographical area. Um, it's severe traffic congestion. We observed that, I observed that for, my, for the first time myself when we visited in um, February earlier this year. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Uh, and the problem is in inadequate coordination and capacity of ambulances. So as I said, there's quite a few ambulances, but they're dotted around individual private hospitals. They're not, uh, they don't really have trained paramedics, hence why we have Welsh Ambulance Service as, as a partner. We might have the overall right capacity, but they certainly don't have any, any coordination. Um, and so this is part of the project is to work with the, uh, the Ministry of Health in Indonesia as well to try to come up with some sort of policy 
uh, and help with overall capacity and how it should be organized. So the people we are working with, the, the great partners we have is the Ambulance 118 service. Uh, it was established in 2005 by the Indonesian Surgeons Association. It operates in those five cities currently, but wishes to expand. It is a, uh, access is via a toll free number, 118. Um, and it's not for profit organization, but it does suggest a donation to help it um, be sustainable. The overall research program for the two years we started last October is shown in this diagram here. We haven't had much time to uh, talk through it all, but we will pick out certain parts. So the first phase was information gathering and data collection. Um, fortunately, we were able to start the uh, project on time, 1st of October. Um, Sari was um, uh, a former PhD student of mine and, um, and had finished and the timing worked very well for us, thankfully, and was able to then move on to this um, and already had a postdoc and worked and moved on to this particular project. And Mark joined in January, uh, in March. Um, so Sari spent some, uh, quite a few months in Jakarta, uh, end of last year and early this year to start the data collection, thankfully before the pandemic uh, hit. Uh, we are hope then to build some spatio-temporal demand forecasting for Jakarta and maybe other cities that would then feed into some optimization models to help where to locate ambulances and not just ambulances but maybe um, you know motorbikes and other ways of accessing um, services maybe even use of drones uh, and that would also be with a simulation uh, framework to help with the decision support system. And the final part would be to offer some um, delivery and development of some sort of OR healthcare resources for, for our partners and wider partners in Indonesia towards the end of the project. Um, just very quickly before I hand over to Sarah because of time, um, this is a nice picture uh, of a very uh, happy time, it doesn't seem uh, that long ago, but uh, uh, February. Um, when we were able to visit, um, the whole team were able to visit for a week and Sari was already out there in um, Indonesia. Um, that's Professor Ario, who is the uh, director of 118 and uh, clearly a very liked and well-known figure in, in Indonesia in terms of the medical services uh, as a previous sur surgeon. Uh, and the team, the team are there. Um, and we had a wonderful week where we had lots of visits to different ambulance um, services and held an international seminar one day workshop when we had speakers from the Ministry of, of Health as well as um, other local um, representatives from paramedics and from hospitals and so forth. Um, and I think uh, Stefan was uh, alluding to the fact about the um, probability of Paul having a uh, an earthquake when he takes his family to Indonesia. Well, with my one single data point of visiting Indonesia, we had an earthquake that week and uh, it was a 6.2 on the on magnitude and uh, it woke me up at night time. So I can say to Stefan in response to your question with my one data point that you're guaranteed to have an earthquake if you visit Indonesia. So I'm going to pass on now to, um, to Sari, who's going to uh, uh, talk through some of the survey data and forecasting. Thank you very much. Paul and uh, hi everyone, I'm Sari and now we are going to focus on to um, a specific area in Indonesia which is Jakarta and highlighting some of the results from the survey and forecasting. Um, but before we, we start, uh, let me summarize a little bit of characteristics of Jakarta and uh, its population. Um, as a city of a uh, capital city of Indonesia, Jakarta has an area of uh, 664 square kilometers, and uh, I think it's uh, less than half of London. Um, this main uh, land in, of Jakarta is divided into 42 districts and uh, further divided into 261 neighborhoods. Um, with respect to populations, it is home of more than 10.5 million people and this gives us a density over 15,000 per square meter. Um, the composition of uh, populations with age 55 and above is just a uh, four point, is pretty much influenced by the neighboring regions, um, west, east and south. And according to the statistics uh, of his report, net commuters to Jakarta every single day is over 1.1 million. Um, next slide, please. And within Jakarta, uh, there are around 189 hospitals for all different sizes and uh, ownership. Only 86 uh, of them have uh, ED department. 
And during 2018, we have a report of 6.3 million visits to hospital, and this including inpatient and outpatients. However, we didn't know how many of these is actually emergency department visits. Um, uh, currently, there are around 70 ambulances, um, a government and private run, um, but this doesn't include um, the ambulance belong to private hospital or any small organizations or organizations such as political organizations. And according to 2019 report, there are around uh, 49,720 calls uh, for the ambulance. And um, joining us, uh, five uh, hospitals, general hospital, four um, uh, government funded and one private. Um, basically, we have two sets of questionnaires that we develop. Um, uh, the first one um, relating to patient demographic profile. Um, this uh, type of questions is actually already done by the hospitals on daily basis, so there's nothing new for them. The second type of question, however, it's relating to the timing uh, data when the emergency uh, happens and then when they actually uh, uh, what is actually transportation mode uh, patient use and uh, with the timing data uh, we gather six timestamps uh, starting from when the emergency uh, even happens until when the patient is actually treated for the first time and then from the six timestamps we uh, defined another six uh, time duration from patient delays to time to treatment we uh, at the moment we don't have much time to talk more detail about this but hopefully we will produce a report so that everybody can um, have a look uh, with respect to medical conditions um, uh, the majority of patients attending uh, emergency departments uh, having general medical conditions and uh, if we break this down into the type of transportation they use, cars were mainly the transportation mode people used to go to the uh, emergency department. And if you could like here see the interesting, um, uh, you know, phenomenon that motorcycles uh, were uh, used um, in a large quantity by patient even compared to ambulance and uh, even with the life-threatening conditions such as trauma, uh, respiratory or cardiovascular diseases, um, you know, we want please. Um, with respect to the transportation, uh, we see the spread of uh, uh, the use of ambulance is very low and in fact only 9.2% uh, of patients using ambulance. And if you look at the uh, bottom right, motorcycles use uh, close to many people, close to, uh, sorry, our hospitals, and probably it's a convenient way to go to the hospital, avoiding the heavy traffic in Jakarta. Uh, other key uh, insight about um, the survey is we ask uh, patients um, why they didn't use the ambulance and uh, around 38% of patients and they were, not, they were not aware that uh, the ambulance actually can help, you know, uh, provide them the service. In fact, uh, of total uh, respondents, 75% percent of them uh, respond they didn't know how to contact ambulance even uh, if they know um, issues such as not available and long time to wait you know uh, still also um, apparent um, small number of people uh, sorry before that um, um, there is a cost involved as well we ask uh, how much actually people spend majority of uh, uh, patients spend well, less than five pounds five pounds is a lot in Indonesia <laughs> um, now we move on to the podcasting. Uh, basically, this is just summarizing um, what the step that we did so far. And from survey data, the majority that, uh, I mean, uh, the main point that we take here is the number of people per neighborhood, and then uh, the ambulance, a number of people using ambulance. Um, okay. Um, we then uh, trained, um, you know, we use, um, uh, the framework that is developed by one of our collaborators. And then we compare logistic regression and naive. Uh, naive. Uh, hello, <laughs> what's happened here? Okay. Um, and then we see that a simple model uh, such as taking average is uh, better than logistic regression model. And then if, uh, okay, we just need to be quick here. And this is just the end things that we want to, to highlight that we want to uh, uh, estimate uh, uh, 
uh, the ambulance need per neighborhoods. However, at this point, we haven't yet introduced the variability because uh, we're having difficulty setting one of parameter. I'm sure that the data exists, but it is a matter of uh, contacting the right people. Um, so in summary, uh, there are two things from the survey. We highlight that the low use of ambulances in uh, Jakarta, it could be due to the lack of uh, understanding and lack of knowledge or population on how to contact the ambulance. And um, uh, from the forecasting point of view, uh, in, uh, uh, if we want to uh, forecast in detail per neighborhoods, uh, it's both, uh, it's uh, uh, its own challenges because uh, currently lack of the published uh, literature that can be accessed. Um, yeah, I think that's all from me. Uh, over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Honor, are we out of time? I think one minute or we finished. Well, we'd like to get Mark on. We don't, we don't want to... Uh, yeah. I, I can be about two and a half minutes if that helps. Yeah, yeah, that'll be fine, Mark. Okay, right. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, in parallel with the work that Sari's been doing, uh, coordinating the collection of data, we've also been looking at optimising ambulance allocation. Um, and we've looked at it in terms of maximising survivability, as I think most people do. So in front of you, you can see the, uh, the, the function we've used, and I'm going to briefly describe that to you working from left to right. So the first thing we look at is the different, uh, it's like demand categories, typically ambulance services categorize things by urgency. Uh, and we look at the different categories of the ambulance users and we can weight them if we want. The next function across the sort of something between uh, a one and M with the Lambda there, that's actually looking at the, the types of demand coming from the different levels ambulance calls are coming from and the third one then is looking at the different ambulance stations themselves and that's where we start to look at a survival function this sl with a ti rho ij in front of it that's basically a survival function in relation to each particular demand category and basically the time of travel is then inputted into it the other thing we then got to consider is ambulance availability and the first thing we look at is what are the chances of an ambulance being available at that particular station and in the, if you look at the next next pair of brackets one minus pi to the power of x pi is the average utilization of the ambulance station and x is the number of ambulance actually stationed there so that gives us the probability of an ambulance being available and then finally we also have to consider the fact that this actually might not be the first ambulance in terms of the most preferable there might be other more preferable stations before that so the final function there, or final part of the function there, just looks at the probability of the preceding stations, the more preferable stations being busy. So that's the optimization function we move. And the process we use to, to actually carry out the optimization is something called cross-entropy optimization. And they, that's a deceptively simple process. In effect, what you do is you generate a, set of, a, a data sample using a set of stochastic rules. And then you use that data set to update these rules so they will produce a better solution in the next iteration. In practice, what that means is that we generate 5,000 random ambulance allocations to the stations, uh, score them all and pick a proportion of those and then use them to produce an initial probability matrix, which is then used in the subsequent iterations uh, to generate solutions and which we then look to improve on each case. So that's what we've done so far. The final thing then that we're looking at doing now is we've talked about having different patient categories, but in the real world, we also have different vehicle types. And this is what I'm actually working on right now. And this is the equivalent of the first expression, but taking into account different vehicle types. And that's where I'll stop if I may. Um, I'll take any questions at the end. Great, thanks Mark. So just very, very quickly then just wrapping up. So the next steps are to finish the forecast and optimization work packages. We want to then uh, feed the information on the demand and the optimization into a DES framework using Python as a decision support tool that's open source that could be used by not just Indonesia, but potentially other countries. Um, we have further planned trips to Indonesia, of course, somewhat disrupted with the, uh, with the pandemic. But we have to uh, re reschedule visits. For example, this very week, 118, we're meant to be visiting Wales for a, for a um, visit to our partners here, and um, that's now all virtual. Uh, and um, de development and delivery, as I said, of a training program towards the end in OR kind of uh, methods, which I'm sure will be helpful. So I'm sorry about running over, but um, 
Thanks for listening. Uh, let me introduce you to the next speaker is um, Konstantinos, uh, a colleague that whom I know since uh, my time in Lancaster. He's going to present a, a talk um, based on the same, uh, based on a project uh, that was that is funded by EPSRC for the same call. Now, the, there is a, a bit uh, there is a bit of intersection between this project and my project relief ops, um, but they 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 also have a, another partner from Sudan. So without further ado, uh, I let Konstantinos to um, present the talk. Konstantinos, over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Stefan, and uh, for for introducing me, and to, uh, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, interesting uh, stream of uh, work that relates to emergency response management. So the work that I'm going to present relates to the Respond OR project, which stands for Resilient Emergency Preparedness for Natural uh, Disaster Response through Operational Research. So the um, at the outset, I would like to recognize the contribution and participation of a number of individuals that have been contributing to the work that I'm going to present. Um, so um, in, in the project, we have um, four academic institutions that they are contributing. Uh, besides Lancaster University, and you can see all the individuals involved from Lancaster in this slide. We have the University of Indonesia, uh, also the University of uh, Gajamanda, and University of Khartoum. So as, as Stefan already uh, introduced, uh, in this project we are not focusing exclusively on Indonesia, but we are looking also on emergency response issues that are related to the situation in Sudan. Uh, it is also very important to recognize the contribution and very active participation of a number of stakeholders. And uh, I would explain in the, in, in the I mean, subsequent slides of my presentation why we consider the involvement of the stakeholders a very important part of the work that we are doing. And uh, they are uh, helping us a lot to set the actual, uh, actually the context of our, of our work and also uh, fulfill the, the requirements. So you can see here that we have stakeholders. Well, Sorry. Yeah, we can't see your slides at the moment. Would you oh, mind oh. resharing them, please? Okay. Can you see them now? Hello? No, not currently. No. Oh, let me see what I can do about that. Uh, so, how about now? Can you see them? No, no, currently. no. No. Okay. Let me see if I can do something about that because uh, let me. Okay. Uh, okay. Perhaps if there is a colleague on the audience um, can send the slides to me, uh, I can operate it as well. Okay, let me see. Uh, so ca can you see the slides now, please? No, unfortunately not, no. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can do. So uh, I don't know how I'm trying different ways of trying to share them with you. But uh, how about now? Can you see them? Yes, Hello? Constantinos. Yes, we can see it. Can you see them now? Yes, we can see it, Constantinos. Okay, good. Okay, thank um, you very much. Thanks. Maybe you just need to uh, click F5. Yeah, correct. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, just uh, what I was trying to say just before is that we are having a number of stakeholders that they are involved in this project and uh, we are considering their, their role very critical for the uh, success of the project okay so uh, the content so the contents of this presentation so i will try to set the context of our work i will provide the objectives and the methodology that we are using to develop uh, our project and then i will provide a kind of a brief overview for three types of problems that we are trying to address in this project namely uh, the evacuation planning personnel scheduling and the allocation and distribution of relief supplies that to some extent may overlap with some of the activities that they are done by 
Stefan and his colleagues at uh, Southampton University in Indonesia. And uh, finally, I will provide some concluding remarks of the work that we have done so far. Okay, so in terms of the context, already uh, Stefan has uh, provided some idea about what is going on in Indonesia. So what I, I just want to stress here is that this is a kind of a global issue and uh, we can see that uh, the 2019 data suggest that uh, we, more, almost 400 uh, disasters have been reported worldwide with a kind of a tremendous impact on human life. So almost 12,000 people, they have lost their lives before because of these disasters. About 95 million people, they have been affected by these uh, disasters. And at the same time, they have been, uh, I mean, the, the financial loss due to these disasters is, uh, uh, I mean, very significant at the range of 100 billion uh, US dollars. So uh, this is uh, what is going on um, globally, but uh, if we focus a little bit more on, on the cases that we have uh, of interest in our project in Indonesia, uh, there is uh, significant uh, activity. I mean, being a country that is sitting on the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, there are so many uh, different types of natural disasters. More uh, uh, information has been already provided by, uh, I mean, the previous uh, presentations, uh, but it is a, a very significant activity that uh, needs to be managed properly. Uh, and then uh, if we look on Sudan, Sudan also is uh, having a number of uh, issues, issues in terms of the uh, uh, of natural disasters and uh, mainly the problem is Sudan, while in, in Indonesia we have a kind of a variety of uh, um, natural disasters. In, in, in Sudan, we have uh, mostly uh, issues that are related with the flooding of uh, the Nile River and uh, the issues that they are uh, generated due to flooding, but also the subsequent emergency management problems that they are related to waterborne diseases that they are created because of the flooding. So this sets a little bit the context of what we are trying to do in this project. And uh, of course, the Sendai uh, Foundation uh, report uh, about the disaster risk reduction has identified the pre preparedness, the enhancement of the preparedness um, actions as uh, one of the most effective uh, ways of uh, reducing the risk uh, for a natural disasters. So we are focusing on the preparedness uh, activities and the response activities. And what we have observed, uh, we, uh, I mean, in looking in the literature is that uh, the complexity of the real world decision making problems is not uh, most of the times captured in models that they have been developed. Uh, most of the models are very generic and they are not looking on very specific circumstances that they are prevailing in certain uh, countries. Uh, the assumptions, some, as a consequence of that, the assumptions made are uh, oversimplifying the reality and uh, they are leading may maybe sometimes to elegant mathematical models, but not necessarily to models that they are reflecting the decision making environment. And uh, uh, as a, a kind of uh, a follow up type of uh, impact, um, this may lead to inefficient allocation of uh, scarce, res scarce resources that uh, most of the times is the case for uh, less developed countries. Uh, in order to cope with this disaster. So therefore, we had identified the need for developing a decision support tool as uh, which aligns well with the stakeholder requirements as a kind of a high priority for our work. So therefore, the, the objectives that we have identified for our project is to uh, develop mathematical models that uh, uh, allocate emergency response resources uh, for combined large-scale natural disasters. Uh, these disasters can happen either simultaneously or sequentially. And this is motivated by the fact, as I already mentioned, in, in Sudan, you may have a flood, but as a, as a consequence of the flooding, you don't have to deal only with the, the flooding impacts, but also you have to uh, uh, deal also with the healthcare impacts that they are generated because of the infectious diseases that they are caused due to the flooding. Same thing, you may have a kind of a sequential type of uh, disasters in, in Indonesia where you may have a kind of an earthquake that may trigger a tsunami and that in that case you have to deal, let's say, with the impacts of the two types of disasters that they are happening, let's say, sequentially. Uh, so 
we would like also to uh, develop integrated models that they capture different levels of decision making. So not only, let's say, operational, but also strategic decisions. Uh, also, we are looking to develop mathematical models that uh, they are focusing on routine and scheduling of humanitarian support resources. And in here, um, and this is motivated by the context of our problems, uh, we would like to take into account uh, explicitly the risk that is emerging uh, from civil conflict that you may have in certain countries. So like in Sudan, there is civil conflict and in, in a number of instances when you have to distribute humanitarian aid, uh, you have the problem of, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, rebels attacking uh, convoys that they are uh, supplying the humanitarian aid and therefore you need to to cope with this uh, issue as a part of your decision-making process. And another issue that we have identified as rather important for our case is the incorporation of fairness criteria in the modeling of uh, emergency response operations. Okay, so in terms of the um, uh, methodology that we have followed, so you can see here the entire life cycle of the project, which starts with uh, uh, setting up the modeling and data requirements, which is a very, let's say, important part of our work in order to give us the appropriate information in order to develop the models that they fit to the requirements of the decision makers. Then um, we have a work package that deals with data management and visualization, and this is rather crucial because there are a number of issues related to data that they need to be updated to capture the dynamical aspects of, of uh, the evolution of the disasters. Then we lead to the, this leads to the mathematical, to the, the development of the mathematical models. Uh, and then the algorithms for the solution of the models, the validation, and this happens in the cooperation with the stakeholders as it uh, is the case for the modeling and data requirements. And then uh, we have uh, the implementation of uh, all the work in the form of a pilot project, okay? So uh, one thing that I would like to stress here is that um, we have used the uh, responsible research and innovation approach in order to develop our work. And uh, we are using the framework that has been suggested by the EPSRC, which uh, includes uh, four uh, major phases. One is to anticipate the impacts of the work that you are doing, to reflect on the purpose and the motivation of the work that you are doing, to engage uh, with, uh, very closely with the stakeholders and then use all the input that you are getting from the stakeholders in order to develop uh, your uh, research uh, agenda. Okay, so this is what we have followed and in this slide you can see the steps that we have followed in order to implement this process. And then, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're talking, looking to address three uh, types of problems, and this is mostly the work that is related to Lancaster University. There are a number of other uh, uh, problems that we are addressing that they are uh, addressed by our uh, colleagues in Indonesia and Sudan. So the three pro types of problems that are addressed by uh, Lancaster University, both for Indonesia and Sudan, they relate to evacuation planning, personnel scheduling, and the allocation and distribution of relief supplies. So um, very briefly for each one of them, I will present what are the requirements and uh, see what is the associated literature gap. Uh, so uh, one issue that uh, it was very apparent to us from the stakeholders for this type of problem was to be able to take into account the dynamic changes of the disaster characteristics and uh, both in terms of the demand and supply uh, then um, there was a very important issue to consider the evacuation of not only people, which is mostly the case in, let's say, in Western societies, but uh, in, in Indonesia and Sudan, there is uh, in, in a number of instances a need to evacuate animals. And there are some, uh, let's say, interesting implications from the point of view of modeling to ensure that uh, people and animals, they are evacuated in uh, places that they are close to each other because people, they have to take care of their animals. Uh, evacuation risk due to disruption and civil conflicts is another issue that uh, it was identified as an important uh, dimension of what we should do. And then in terms of uh, uh, objectives, we have conflicting objectives in terms of fairness and efficiency. 
And uh, another very interesting uh, aspect that came out of uh, our work in Sudan is that when you are evacuating people and you are allocating people to shelters, you have to take into account that uh, uh, what is going to be the tribal composition of the population. So you, there are certain instances that uh, you don't want to have in the same shelter people that are coming from different tribes that they have conflicts among each other. So therefore, these are, uh, let's say, requirements that uh, uh, we found out uh, uh, through our work with the stakeholders. And uh, the models that we are proposing here, uh, you can see very in a very concise manner. So they include the uh, objectives of fairness in terms of minimizing the maximal travel time for, um, uh, the, for all uh, places that they need to be evacuated, uh, efficiency in terms of the number of shelters to be used and the number of vehicles that have to be used. So we seek to minimize them. And also we try to minimize evacuation risk. And then we have a number of constraints that are associated to the fact that all people and animals, they need to be evacuated. We have to uh, respect the shelter capacities. We have to respect the evacuation fleet capacities. Um, there is an upper bound for the allowable time to, uh, to uh, complete the evacuation. And of course, you need to uh, ensure that you are not allocating a population in the same shelter that they may be in conflict due to their tribal uh, composition. Okay, so inputs uh, uh, related to this type of model, the possible shelter locations and capacities, the number of people and animals to be evacuated, the composition of the population in terms of their tribal origin and network data, uh, uh, mainly distances and risks associated with the links of the network. And the outputs uh, are the shelters that are going to be used, the allocation of the population, and the definition of the evacuation routes. Okay, um, so in a similar manner, we have worked with the personnel scheduling problem, where again, we had issues uh, that uh, came out of uh, the specific context of the problem. So efficiency and fairness is again an issue in terms of uh, allocating uh, and scheduling personnel. And when we're talking about personnel, scheduling is the personnel that is going to be used in order to provide assistance to people that they have been affected by the, uh, by the disasters. And, and again, uh, here there are some peculiarities. We have uh, to integrate volunteers along with professionals and we have to uh, consider them in, in pro pro producing a kind of an integrated uh, personnel allocation and scheduling for providing their services. And another issue also that came out from this, uh, our discussion with stakeholders is uh, the burnout effect. People that are working in the field, especially under adverse conditions and uh, looking on all this pain and suffering that they have to deal with, they are having a kind of an overload both mentally and physically and therefore this issue has to be taken into account in allocating the personnel resources and the scheduling them. Again, uh, we're talking about multi-objective optimization modeling where we take into account uh, efficiency in terms of minimizing the service completion times, fairness, uh, in terms of minimizing the maximum deviation from the average service completion time, overall demand points, and uh, uh, minimization of personnel transportation risk, again, uh, adhering to the uh, corresponding constraints that you can see in here. So for, in the interest of time, I will go a little bit faster. So uh, I have exceeded that, but uh, given that we lost some time for the... Uh, to reestablish the, the screen sharing. So um, for the allocation of the distribution of relief supplies, again, um, major issues here relate to, to fairness. So this is an issue that we may also discuss with our colleagues, uh, colleagues from Southampton. We're talking about fair allocation of relief supplies in terms of the quantities that they are delivered to the different, uh, to the different communities, but at the to the different shelters, but at the same time, uh, we are looking to be fair for all types of supplies, not uh, as a kind of an aggregate measure of uh, fairness. And also, uh, we are looking about uh, fairness in terms of the de delivery time for all uh, places that they need to be supplied. Okay, And then uh, the, the resulting problem is a kind of a multi-commodity, multi-vehicle, split delivery, multi-echelon problem with cross-docking, 
which is rather complicated. And from what we have seen in the literature, the types of, um, uh, let's say, objectives and constraints we have um, uh, present a lot of interest since they have not been addressed in, in the past, okay? Uh, so again, the objectives here is to minimize uh, the, uh, to optimize the fairness in terms of the supply quantity, the fairness in terms of the distribution time and the efficiency in terms of the resources that they are used in order to deliver the supplies and um, the transportation cost, okay? So um, uh, just to, to wrap it up, a uh, few concluding remarks. Uh, we have elicited uh, all the stakeholder requirements and we have uh, modeled them. So the current status of our work is that uh, we have three papers under development that they are reporting each one of the three prob uh, problems. And we have some uh, initial results in terms of uh, solving uh, smaller case problems. Uh, of course, there is some scalability issues there in terms of, of the size that we can solve with the exact methods that we have been trying. So therefore, we are working on the development of efficient heuristics in order to address uh, all three types of problems. Uh, and um, some of the challenges that we are um, facing are related to the uh, customization of the data uh, the, uh, and the management of the data, especially data that they are capturing dynamic aspects that uh, we need uh, uh, to uh, uh, s somehow um, collect almost in real time from different sources in order to be able to have a, a clear picture of what is the current status of the uh, network over which the, uh, let's say, the evacuation or the routing takes place, but at the same time to have a very good visibility of what are the demand requirements as the, uh, um, the disasters are evolving over time. And, uh, and a crucial issue in developing the decision support system is the vis visualization and communication of the data because uh, having all these uh, multi-objective models and having uh, very strong trade-offs between the objectives, one needs to be very efficient in uh, feeding this information to decision makers in order to make uh, appropriate decisions regarding the trade-offs that are presented to them. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Again, I would like to recognize the EPSRC a GCRF uh, program for supporting this work and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Konstantinos. Um, now we, we have a Q&A session. Uh, can I offer the, the, first to, uh, the, first, the first one to Anna Nagurni? Um, she is a very well-known um, researcher in this area. Uh, Anna, uh, I can't see her anymore. Um, oh, I see. I think she may have gone. She may have gone. Okay. Um, in that case, then uh, I'll. Maybe, uh, Paul, there are some questions addressed to you. Maybe you can uh, answer it verbally while waiting for new questions coming in. Sure, Stefan. Yeah, I think there were some couple of really nice questions. Thank you to those who posted them. Uh, I think one was just to reiterate that, yes, I mean, the idea of a model that could be used for other countries. So we are clearly obviously working with Indonesia and there will be specific uh, needs and parameters, if you like, for that country, but um, particularly around traffic congestion and so forth. But I guess we're trying to make our models as generic as possible. So yes, in answer to that question, they can therefore hopefully be picked up by other countries with kind of local parameterization, such as traffic time, speeds, networks, uh, local configurations of different types of vehicles and so forth. So that was one, and, and briefly, the other question was a really nice question around, um, you know, in terms of modeling scenarios, in terms of, sending a paramedic first, for example, on a motorbike, followed up by a ambulance that would transport the patient to a hospital. That's exactly what we're trying to, to, to achieve and look at in our scenarios, as well as maybe the use of drones, uh, for example, to send defibrillators, deliver defibrillators uh, quickly to patients, because simply the traffic congestion is horrendous. If you've been to Jakarta, you'll experience it firsthand. So, Things like that, as well as 
trying to better understand why only 9% from our surveys people take an ambulance. I mean, I'm sorry, sorry, I might want to chip in here, but you know, this, this issue that there's, no, there's not visibility of an ambulance service, it's like not, not a cultural norm like it is in the UK to pick up and phone for an ambulance. And um, there might be, there's many interesting reasons why that's the case from the surveys. And I'm sorry, you want to quickly chip in there and say, um, why that might be the case and, and perhaps modeling the scenarios whereby that was more routinely available so there might be a higher demand. I think that's one of the key things is not to just assume going forward that the same 10% of people phone. What would the demand what would the demand look like and the required capacity look like for Jakarta if there was a more or, a properly organized uh, ambulance service? Okay, thank you Paul. Uh, we have Anna Nakuni here. Uh, Perhaps Anna would like to uh, say something. Anna, you can turn on your video and mic. I think I'm unmuted. I'm not sure about the video. Okay, I can. Hear, we can hear you. Okay, so I want to thank everyone for this session. It, it has been so inspirational, absolutely fantastic. Congratulations and kudos. I have learned so much. And especially what I appreciate uh, tremendously is how you're working so closely with the stakeholders, which I think is outstanding. And not only that, you're bringing in all sorts of uh, special issues into consideration, which I haven't seen before. Uh, the multiple objectives is really, really important. And I appreciate it. You're bringing in special kinds of objectives. Okay, so uh, kudos to you, different kinds of trade-offs. And you're working in very challenging countries. In Indonesia, obviously, you know, uh, Professor Sang's uh, heart is in Indonesia, and also Sudan, which brings particulars into the discussion and into the optimization of mathematical modeling. I've also been fascinated about the work Professor Harper is doing. I'm teaching a course on transportation logistics and congestion is such a big issue in my course. And to see that actually incorporated in terms of uh, medical ambulances and disaster relief, I think is quite novel. And I had no idea that there are so many accidents in Jakarta. So thanks so much for this very, very informative session. I look forward to much more research coming out. I don't want to put more pressure on you, but it's very exciting to see the kind of work you're doing. So congratulations. I'm so glad I could join you. And finally, the internet came back up. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you, Anna. There are disruptions now. Yeah. These are Thank my you, daughter Anna. figure skating medals, not my medals, by the way. <laughs> we lost you. Yeah. OK. Thank um, you so much, Anna. Yeah, there is a, a question here, um, maybe to all panelists, maybe Konstantinos uh, can answer as well. Um, my country, the Philippines, encounters similar problems. Can you extend your study here? Maybe Konstantinos or Paul? Oh, yeah, uh, actually, I mean, from, from our side, uh, we're trying to uh, definitely, uh, let's say, capture specific requirements of uh, uh, the stakeholders we're working with, but. Uh, Apparently, there are lots of uh, opportunities for, let's say, generalizing the work that we are doing. Uh, we have uh, already identified that, uh, for instance, Sudan and Indonesia, although they are uh, completely different, uh, let's say, places of the, on the globe, but uh, the, the way that they are dealing with the, 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 the disaster response shares lots of similarities in terms of objectives and constraints, so definitely, uh, the models that we are developing can be used or will be, uh, it will be possible to be used by other countries. And we will be glad to cooperate with people that uh, they are located in other places that they may want to use the knowledge that we are going to be to create through this project. Uh, Paul, do you have anything can to I, add? Um, can I oh, sorry. Uh, add in there just a, a warm welcome to um, uh, Milagros from um, the, the Philippines because um, she's a she's a, a colleague from uh, a friend from many years um, of the Euro working group on OR for development so it's great to hear from you in the Philippines Milagros thank you <laughs> um, at, at the, there is a comment from uh, uh, Carl um, maybe perhaps Carl could um, say something 
maybe so that people, uh, all the audience can hear it? Okay, can you hear me? Hello there. Hi, yes, we can hear uh, you. I don't have the video at the moment, but, um, but first of all, congratulations on very good projects. Um, one, one issue which I've just flagged in the chat, uh, perhaps not surprising coming from a home background, is um, to what extent is the um, project implementation uh, working with local stakeholders like local government and city administrations, which of course, if you look at the, um, the, the, the progress in the last four years of the um, 2030 agenda and indeed the Sendai framework have been very much flagged as key implementation actors rather than just national governments. Uh, and so it'd be interesting to get a reflection on to what extent, you know, disaster mitigation, other things, uh, and the ambulance services are, are working with the local administrations and trying to integrate that into their local development plans. Um, but otherwise, very impressed with the projects. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, Carl. Um... There is also a question about SDG, uh, SDG um, basically asking about uh, our, with, which SDG that we are focusing on. I have already answered for the uh, relief ops, my projects. We are working specific, uh, focus, we are focusing on SDG 11, which is sustainable cities and communities, and as well as SDG 2, zero hunger, because uh, we are focusing more on the food supply chains for during disasters. Uh, perhaps, I don't know, uh, Paul or uh, Konstantinos would probably say something about SDG while we are on SDG topics. Uh, hello, yes. Uh, actually, uh, not surprisingly, we are dealing with this similar types of SDGs, as, as you have mentioned already, uh, trying to uh, support sustainability of, 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 of urban areas uh, and also um, supporting, let's say, the health and the well-being of people. So we are addressing. And uh, also um, SDGs that are related to, to, to fairness and uh, equality is also very important. And this is why we have introduced this as explicit objectives in, in, in our formulations as well. Yeah, thank you. And just, just to add the same from us, obviously on the health, but also the inequality SDG 10. Okay. I mean, obviously in terms of particularly the ambulance service, it seems to be in terms of how much you can afford to pay for an ambulance. So very few people can afford private ambulances so clearly there's a need for a, a national uh free at the point of use service or something or some properly funded which is equitable for the whole population okay thank you um we don't have any other question um i, I wonder if juliana would like to say something about use of drones uh, she has got a, an open question okay let me just enable can juliana talk uh, okay, uh, let me just give yeah. Juliana. Yeah. Okay. okay. I unmute myself. So, um, regarding the, yeah, I, I actually gave um, some comments regarding the use of drones um, that Paul mentioned. So, there is a um, regulation constraint on the use of drones in the city area. So, that can be a practical constraint on the modeling if um, drone is considered. Yeah, thank you very much for your question, Juliana. Um, yeah, we're very aware of that. I mean, drones, uh, Justin Boutillier, who's one of the, uh, on the project partner from University of Wisconsin-Madison, he's previously worked as a postdoc at MIT, and before that was a PhD student in um, University of Toronto. He, the reason why he's a key partner as well for us is he's actually worked on exactly this topic about use of drones in Toronto, downtown Toronto. Uh, and they're actually trialing uh, in Toronto now the use of drones to deliver defibrillators, so in an urban area. So it's possible, but it takes a lot of coordination, of course. So I think we're hoping that from the insights that him and his team will glean from Toronto might be uh, helpful for Jakarta. But um, it's just one of many types of, if you like, uh, emergency vehicle or response that we're going to consider. But it would be uh, it'd be useful to to look at that. But you're right; it takes there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, issues around that to make that happen in practice. Okay, thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Paul. I'm wondering if there is any uh, any uh, anyone in the audience from um, other countries uh, want to talk, want to share their experience, or want to comment on this on this topic. Uh, maybe put it on the chat or Q QA, uh, Q and A panel. We have heard something from uh, from Philippines. Yeah. 
No. Could I just could I just add, can I just add sorry Stephen regarding the Philippines question that likewise would love to work there frankly but the unfortunately the, the constraints of the of the project that we're all working with the two year funding is quite tight already um, <laughs> and obviously it had to be defined to a particular country that was part of the call um, but yes as we've discussed a lot of these problems of course uh, across many LMIC so it would be yeah so maybe as an opportunity to uh, as a follow on project for others maybe there could be some coordination to make that happen that would be wonderful. Okay, thank you, Paul. In that case, then probably we will close this sessions. Uh, I just want uh, to. Uh, there is a, a project uh, uh, led by Paula Scapara and also Konstantinos and myself and Christine um, that involves uh, several countries in Southeast Asia: Cambodia, um, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, and Indonesia. So yeah, so it, it would be nice to to see how these methodologies can work in uh, different countries. Um, Honora, do you have anything else to uh, to say to close up this session? Thank. Oh, I think we're going. N nothing further to say, but okay. thank you, thank you everybody. So, thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah, uh, and hope to see you in the other sessions. And please send us emails and if you uh, like to discuss more about this topic. Okay, thank you, and bye bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.